Hello, this is Devika Nardik from Shikshangan Education Initiatives and we're bringing you a series on what are some of the ideas on intelligence. I thought I'll do this because in my work with teachers, what I've seen is we get hooked to whatever is the latest research and that becomes the flavor of the season. But it's important to understand what is the history of the work that human beings have done in understanding the dimensions of intelligence. And so we thought we will do this one by one and introduce a couple of ideas to you. So let's begin with first understanding what is a normal conception of who is intelligent amongst all of us. We might possibly think that somebody who gets high marks and that too in mathematics and science, mind you, that's an intelligent person. Or we might be thinking that if you have certificates and if you have degrees, then maybe you're an intelligent person. There could be some other misconceptions like you need to be very good at mathematics alone or at least if you have to be considered to be intelligent or you might think oh my god she's got admission to a foreign university fellowship or otherwise and therefore he or she is intelligent what about socially acceptable etiquettes and good behavior top show but you might feel that that's an intelligent person there could be some extension when we're beginning to feel that not just knowing information and facts and conceptual understanding but if you're able to apply that knowledge maybe then you're intelligent we also can feel that those who get lots of awards and rewards are the intelligent people. This is why the obsession of rewards at all ages, you know, and we know that there's an industry about getting awards and rewards and ranking. We might think that those who are able to solve problems, not just mathematically or even otherwise, they are intelligent. And of course, English is such a mark of, oh my God, she's intelligent. Look at the quality of her language. So these are some of the ideas we may have and we may not. I've just put down a few on this slide to show you that we need to discard all these ideas and think about various ways in which people have really interpreted this enigma called intelligence. So I'm going to begin with, of course, Alfred Binet, the father of it all. And we've all encountered him when we did our teacher training courses. Okay? So he gave us the idea of intelligence quotient or IQ. But way back in 1920, even if you've taken a test like I have, who even remembers the IQ score now, actually? No. But what was Binet doing? He was asked to really develop a test simply for the war. World War I, one, and we know it's a standardized test, the Binet Simon scale, where every time that you take the test, you should be getting the same score. Sometime in 1910 or so, they modified it, and therefore now, Students from age group 3 to 13 are able to take this test, as we know. We also know what IQ is, so I don't need to spend a lot of time here. We know that it's a score that you get, and we know the calculation, don't we? Actually, we're looking for what is the current, current mental age of the student or this adult. And how do you calculate the mental age? You administer the test, which is in either language, linguistic ability, and mathematical and logical ability, only that. Those are the only parameters, okay? And then what they do is that they calculate the IQ by mental age above chronological age into 100. And we know that 140 IQ, etc., are considered to be gifted, okay? We also have schools for gifted children. Uh, so that was one of the old ideas about IQ. But here is something interesting, a story that I've brought to you, which will help us understand that was that really enough or is that really enough even today? So I'm sitting in Pune in Maharashtra in India, which showcases a beautiful, it's a showpiece for the Indian Army, which is the National Defense Academy. It is nestles in very, very verdant valleys and hills and gorgeous. And every year, one cadet who passes out, there's a passing out parade, which is a very flamboyant and uh, glamorous affair, and everybody looks forward to that. And one cadet gets what is known as the sword of honor, and this is presented by the chief of Indian Army staff. Now, getting that sword of honor is no joke, as I will show you what does it mean to get there, okay, very, very briefly. On an average, 12 lakh plus people apply for admission to NDA, both men and women now. It's much, much higher than what, what IITs might attract, as you can see. Out of this, 30 to 40,000 actually clear the written examination and just 500 to 800 get recommended for the further step. 
out of this, just 250 students really make it to the prestigious NDA. It's a graduation course after 12. Like they say, they make a man out of a boy or a woman out of a girl and so on. You know? So that's hard, rigorous training there, both physical and intellectual. And there are many parameters on which they are judged before they get the sword of honor. There are seven actually, but we need not go into that. That tough, huh? To get that. And here is something interesting. The history of all these cadets and, and the NDA shows that most of the cadets who got the sword of honor never really went on to become the chief of Indian Army staff. Huh? So what does that mean then? What probably it means is possibly that just a high IQ may not be enough for social success. You need a lot more and which is how more ideas about intelligence come to us. So what do you think is missing in an IQ score? And therefore, Daniel Goldman spoke, spoke about emotional quotient or EQ. And that's what we're going to be talking about in the next episode, because we need to take you through the history of everything which has been done before we come to the newest and latest ideas at the, at the moment. If you like what Chikshangan presents, which is backed by a lot of research, a lot of our own reading and our own experience, do subscribe to our channel and spread the good word. Till we meet again.